everyone, Anthony Gordon here, a filmmaker of 22 years behind the camera, but also in front of the camera. And uh, as part of a new series for Zoom, we're doing a, uh, well, I guess, a chat with a whole lot of creatives, musicians, podcasters, filmmakers around the world. Sound is a new 4K, because really regardless of what kit you're using, unless you get the sound right, it doesn't really matter. Today we've got, a, I guess, a pretty special guest, uh, Jamie Pultz. Now, he's an uh, ex-Queensland uh, Queensland copper, um, or police officer for those that don't know what cops are and uh, he's actually shifted from the world of law enforcement to a different kind of enforcement using a podcast to to really change people's idea of uh, of a number of things um, mate g'day Jamie well, welcome on board here yeah g'day Anthony thanks for having me mate it's an honor but, uh, so so for those people I didn't want to give too much of an intro because I think what you've done and what you're doing is pretty extraordinary maybe just give us a bit of a nutshell of where you're at, where you came from, and, and, and what's actually been happening. Yeah, sure, mate. Well, in uh, 2013, February 2013, I joined the Queensland Police. And, you know, that was good and that was fun. And uh, I did that up until the end of... Um, I started my new job in 2017. And I basically was just getting burnt out. You know, it's a pretty uh, demanding job. Um, you know, I could have probably taken some leave and recouped and gone back to work, but my parents had a full-time job for me in a family business and I was just, I had two new kids. The shift work was um, playing with me and basically I just thought, well, I'm going to step away from this. Uh, while I was um, in my first year at Gympie police station, which is about an hour north or probably two hours north of uh, Brisbane, Queensland's capital city, I was working at a place called Gympie station and I was exposed to a, a number of situations there. And, and, and one of them was this girl, uh, Kira McLaughlin and I was 27 she was 27 and you know she was in a relationship that was um, obviously questionable uh, she had four kids but her partner had a, had a pretty bad rap and um, he was a bad dude so basically I was exposed to a number of situations there and while I was at Gympie um, she actually was killed or she died suspiciously and you know six years later no one's been charged and when I left the police that's always haunted me because, you know, I was one of those police officers who was um, involved to a degree, albeit that I was a, a new officer, you know, it just always played on my mind how serious the job is and how, um, how things can, can unfold. So when I did leave the police, I thought now I'm in a position to do something about this. And, you know, podcasts, I've always been into them. I've always been into crime, true crime books and movies and, you know, like obviously serial, the, um, probably the most downloaded podcast ever really got me into it. And I thought, you know, I'm an ex cop. Um, I knew the case, nothing's been done about it. I'm in a good situation here um, to reach out. And so I reached out to my other mate, who's actually a journalist and he's an ex cop as well. I worked with him at Gippy and he remembered the case. He was involved in it. He was actually at the crime scene that night. And um, we then made this decision to do, to go for it. Um, we, met uh kira's mum the victim's mum and you know she along with her solicitor gave us her blessing and it just took off from there mate it really did we had like literally no podcast experience i had no gear i was just youtubing what to buy and luckily i came across um the zoom product um the h6 which was probably the most recommended product and you know i'm glad i invested in that because it could do everything for me and um yeah like it just took off mate it took off I guess, uh, well, for, for starters, you're never really an ex-cop because once you're a cop, you've got that in your blood and you've got the, the, the knowledge, the experience. Uh, and also, I guess, you're still a storyteller because you're still interviewing people. You're interviewing people in normally intense situations. Um, yeah. You're a negotiator. You're a peacekeeper. You're, a, you're everything. And I think those, those tools have set you up really well in order to apply to whatever technology you've got because, I guess without the ability to use new technology, you'd be relying on the old traditional newspapers and, and traditional broadcasts to, to put the story yeah. across. I mean, is that not mind blowing to you that the technology <clears throat> exists now to really be, I guess, judge, jury, executioner on what you want? Oh, mate. Be? yeah, for sure. I think everybody's jumping on the um, podcast wagon or the audio book wagon. I mean, it's such a good medium. You can do it with like read, you can do it while you're exercising while you're going to sleep, while you're working, there's no limits to it. Whereas, you know, traditional media, like reading a book or 
um, watching a movie, you're limited to sitting down and watching it or sitting down and reading it, but there's no end to it. And everybody's seen, like true crime is generally the most popular genre. So it shows that people like in the top 10 right now, I think top 10 podcasts, I think four or five of them are true crime. So it shows that people are thirsty and hungry for it, that most people do have uh, a sense of justice. And, you know, I, I think, you know, if two guys like myself and Tom, who, who eventually stepped out, but can set up a podcast and get people to listen and, and want that justice. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's mind blowing, mate. It's, it's absolutely mind blowing. Whereas back in the day, you couldn't just set up a camera and put it on channel seven and be famous. Like there's no way, you know? So, so what, what, what challenges do you, I mean, cause you obviously had your challenges being in the police force to start with. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, a lot of people don't realize how tough a career it is because they only see the, the fun side of it on TV and movies. Yeah. How does that compare to the challenges that you then faced trying to put a podcast together? Because then you've gone from being, um, I guess, helpless in a situation because the legal system didn't work mm -hmm. for you to having all the power and control, which in some respects can be almost more debilitating. Mm. Yeah, it was a tricky um, path to navigate because when, when you start these things, you don't really know where to start. It's kind of like moving house. Like, where do you start? <laughs> so... Anyway, so we just started, we, um, we reached out to Alison and basically we met her first. Uh, she's the victim's mum. We, you know, went over to her house. Um, she got to know us and then eventually she goes, all right, well, let's record. So we brought over our recorder there and I think I just recorded for like three hours. So that was, that was very hard to go back and like edit that. And, um, you know, I don't know, but I guess what we're worried about is, you know, what ramifications there might be or uh, re repercussions, um, legal things, um, you know, like you're trying to paint people in the best light possible and not edit out their words out of context. Um, but I think what I found in regard to what you're asking is that people trusted me. I found that I was a police officer, but they spoke to me more now that I wasn't a police officer, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. I think when you got the uniform on, it's a bit intimidating and um, stuff like that. But people actually are, some people actually asked me for proof that I was an officer and, you know, I'd, you know, I just had to show them like a photo when I was in the job and they'd be like, okay, I'll, I'll talk. And they just, they just, a lot of the time they just spill the beans. I think it's all about finding rapport, um, neutral ground. Um, but yeah, the challenges I faced, you know, are different. Like I do feel like sometimes I feel like shit. I've actually put myself into this situation. This is a dark, twisted tale. And I've put myself in here. I've immersed myself. I've done this by choice. It's not because of my job. You know, I'm involved in these people's pain. And that's been a challenge, you know, to, to deal with that. But like, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people never realize as storytellers, and I've been doing nah. this for probably 22 years now. And you, you find that if you're, uh, I mean, I've obviously spent a lot of time um, dealing with, uh, with, with people in, in either law enforcement or in the military or in crisis situations. And you bring up a really interesting point because they're there as part of their job in a way that, okay, so you've signed up to do it. As storytellers now, which you're discovering, you're choosing to go down these holes. And every time you interview, you tell a story, I, I, I've got like a, a two to one coefficient that every sort of 100% I put in, 50% comes out of me. Yeah. And, very, and how, yeah. how, how have you found that journey? Yeah, I find that's very accurate for me too. Um, like, you know, you, you get messages all day. Like when, when you're a police officer, you leave the job behind and yeah, you do take it home with you to a, to a degree, but doing this, people can message me on Facebook or email me or call me 24 seven. And that does happen. You know, you might get a message from someone wanting to talk or they know something or they're upset with you or, uh, they need to debrief and yeah, it's been, it's, it's been really difficult, um, you know, to walk into that pain, like, but you have to remember that they're probably feeling it a hundred times worse than you are. And, you know, you got to learn those, you got to have those measures in place where you can distance yourself to a, you know, to a degree, um, coping mechanisms, but also to be compassionate. And I think when I was in the Academy, they put it really well. They said like, you know, empathy versus sympathy. And I don't know if this is verbatim what, what the facilitator said, but they said, you know, sympathy is, uh, empathy is seeing someone drowning and you jumping in there with them and drowning with them. 
and sympathy <laughs> is throwing a lifeline to them and pulling them in or offering them help. And I found that like a, weird, a really good way. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's, I found that a really good way to digest that, um, or the, I don't know, the motive behind how you should do things. And, you know, like don't jump in there and feel everything they feel because you'll be, you'll be a crumpled mess in, in about six months. But, but offer support and offer help and, and be there, but don't feel it with them. And, um, yeah, that's... It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a very interesting interesting angle, certainly from a storyteller, especially with the tools that you, you're using at the moment. Because, as you said, with a the uniform, there's a persona, yeah? yeah so when, you, yeah. when you're walking in the summer with a microphone as opposed to a camera, so the way I, I looked at your story is when you walk in as a copper, you're walking in and you're interviewing people with a camera because yep. it's, it's right there. It's a situation. Yep. When you walk in with an audio device, you basically, you're removing that stigma and therefore... It doesn't exist. So people will just open up and tell you things to a microphone that you will never normally get on a camera. So for the last probably five years, all the dialogue I've got for any of my films or documentaries have all been without a camera. It's just, I just use the F1 um, Zoom device with different yeah. microphone heads and, and literally yeah. it's all on all, all dialogue because it doesn't matter what situation you're in, people are happy to talk to you. But then what that does, and this is a, the, the next sort of question for you, is it gives them a false sense of trust, right? So they, they believe that you are now part of their family. Yeah. And that, that, that draws you in. How have you found this, especially because it's a very sensitive topic and also with the other podcasts that you're looking at doing, mm. do you find yourself being drawn in as a storyteller now? Yeah. Because that trust is a different level? And, and, yeah. and how, do you, how, how are you managing that? Well, that's a very hard question because it's a you got to juggle those things like on one hand to get people's trust and to be a good storyteller obviously it's different for everyone but for me i find that one of my abilities um is being able to draw stuff out of people but you can't really do that by being just a shell you have to engage with them you have to um show that you can trust them and they trust you so there is a bit of give and take there and i think you do have to leave a bit of yourself like i can honestly say that my blood sweat and tears have been in my the two podcasts that I've done so far, you know, it's cost me a lot of um, time, a lot of money, and a lot of you know, like my family's had to pick up my slack. You know, being invested, I haven't been present the whole time. I've been, which is probably unhealthy, you know, like being too too engaged in it and, and never taking a step back. And but I think I've got to learn better skills um, to be able to do as you say and and be able to be a storyteller, but not be sucked in. To their world or be part of their family but just be a mutual person i don't know how you do that i, I honestly don't know <laughs> i was hoping you had some answers for me mate it's uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's it's kind of funny because the number of times that that i've i've lost count of the number of times i've been working with professional athletes or or just subjects in in, in my films and then you you turn around and say let's go okay, well, now we're um, we're done and they look at you and go, well, what do you mean we're done and yeah. it's like well we're done. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and it's like, it's like you, 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 you've split up with them in a relationship. And, uh, and you yeah, said there's, right. there's a, there's, there's a, there's a real vested interest. I've never had any answers for that. And, uh, and then mm. of course, um, then when you come home, as you said, you still got to put the trash out. You still got to change the nappies. You still got to do oh, everything. Yeah. Nothing changes, right? Nothing changes. And it's a, it's a real mind, mind bender. Um, and, and not only that, but like um, when, when you you've taken someone on a journey, like for example, um, being on Valley road, um, my first podcast with, with, um, Kira McLaughlin, I've, you know, she did willingly do it, but I've dragged Alison through some really hard times by help, having her tell her story. And also, you know, some of the other people involved in the podcast who had to tell their story. I mean, they all did it willingly, but like I've asked them to do, to put their, I don't know, hard on the, on the floor. And, you know, so I've, I've asked them to do that. So I do have some sort of um, degree of responsibility, I suppose, to, you know, to be there for them or to at least ask them how they're going or to answer a text message every now and again. But yeah, it is a fine line to know when to, to when to switch off and when to, yeah, engage. It's a storyteller's responsibility. And, and I think, um, with being in Valley Road, which I guess has been the most publicised, uh, mm. I guess, podcast and story through the ABC recently. Yeah. One thing I want to chat to you about is is the the characters. When, you, when you're when you a storyteller, you've got to choose your characters. 
and 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 especially with the podcast and and of course we'll talk about the technical side of it a bit a bit a bit later but when you take these people on these journeys they're also their life's changing as a result of that journey so when you go into a situation if you're a police officer you know that when you walk through that door everything's going to change regardless yeah. of what happens for both yourself and the subject inside mm. depending upon how things play out mm -hmm. do you think and this is probably a pretty big question do you feel that a microphone is more powerful than a gun well yeah i mean that is a that is a big question but I have always used, and they do push it, they push it pretty hard in the academy. And, and you know, they, they always say tactical communications, you know, that's, that's a use of force. That's one of your resources that you can go to is tactical communications. And I've always used, tried to use my words before anything else. Um, yeah, you, I mean, you can't reason with a drunk person. That's for sure. I learned that in the watch house. Um, but, but mostly you can, you can like talk your way in or out of something. Um, and yeah, I think if you give people power, like a platform to speak, have their, have their um, opinion shared, you know, like this poor woman, Alison, who, whose daughter was forgotten, giving her, um, you know, hooking up, especially like you said before, a lapel microphone was fantastic because they can't see it. They just talk. And that was just so powerful. She just, opened up and they all did they all did so i it's almost like the pen's mightier than the sword uh, i do think so i do think so you know yeah, yeah a lot of people don't realize that that, 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 that it's an innocuous tool it's just a little you know little little device with a with a, with a, with a fuzzy head on it can be so powerful and i, and I think i've found situations um it's almost quite cathartic because the microphone also is not just a negotiator it's a counselor um and i want to ask you about that side of it because the, the person that really resonated with, with me in the, in the, in the Bean Valley series was um, the, uh, called the accused ex-girlfriend. Yeah. Katie. Um, an ex-partner. Cause Katie was, um, she was, she resonated and, and, and it's almost <clears throat> like she needed to tell this story. If it wasn't for your microphone, you being there, mm. her life would be very different. Um, how is, how's this process from your storytelling with her? Where would she be if this hadn't happened? Yeah, great question. Well, I can't say enough about Katie. I think she's such a strong, courageous woman. Um, she's been through a lot. She's been through hell and back. And, you know, for her to come on and put all that out there for, you know, a lot of people to listen to is just amazing. And I take my hat off to her. I respect her enormously. And she, you know, she could have ended up dead as well. And she does blame herself that she's not dead and Kira did die. But I think for her, she's thanked me, you know, recently at a coronial inquest, you know, she thanked me um, for, for doing this, which is, which meant heaps to me because I think for her to be able to tell her story and be able to explain, like, there's a few things that people have got wrong and including myself. One, um, why don't people just leave a domestic violence relationship? That's, that's um, the main thing. Like, and two, how do they get themselves into that? And, she basically, as you said, she came across so well, she vented her story and she had to get it off her chest. It was eating her alive. And, you know, she did say that it rattled her after, like she was a bit, you know, rattled after talking about it, but, and especially after watching Australian story, but I think, you know, it was therapeutic for her. It definitely was therapeutic for Alison to tell her story. Um, but yeah, Katie had some, some wounds that needed to be, needed to be healed and she just yeah she was just open um yeah I, I, now, that, that's the power of storytelling that's the power of what you brought to mm. it i mean from so so moving on from that into this new skills you've got now i mm -hmm. mean you know with uh with this experience i'll just uh, i'll stay with the, uh, your career just for one more question with the skills and the knowledge you've got now through the podcast and through the power of conversation and the technology you've used if you'd gone back into the force now, do you think you'd be a different copper than you were? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've never heard that put that way. That's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I definitely think so. I think that's, yeah, 100% because I would rely more on, yeah, my personable skills and, you know, try and 
like even though I did that to begin with, but I think I've really honed in on that and I'd be, I'd just be able to read people a bit better and body language, yeah, body language is a big thing. Um, just trying to find that rapport and common ground. And yeah, I do think that, yeah, it's definitely helped me. I think everyone should, should engage in um, conversations more, just like find somebody, have a chat to them, and actually listen rather than like when you're a cop, you know, you're taking notes, you're not necessarily listening to what they're saying you might be taking dot points but you're not actually hearing it and you're too focused on other things you've got you got to be spatially aware you've got you know so i think definitely i've improved those skills of um of listening and also communicating yeah really interesting maybe maybe the uh the cop the cop schools all around australia should uh should start doing media courses hey <laughs> oh mate for <laughs> sure uh, yeah so with so now now you've got this this I guess it's almost like a newfound superpower, isn't it? You know, you yeah. you 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 discovered the power of the of the word and, and the story, and it can be quite compelling. On your journey now, with the I mean, let's let's talk a little bit about the the, the, te the technical side of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Technology is pretty simple, but what what I really find in my personal experience using the Zoom product, it doesn't matter what situation I'm in. It just works. You can just walk yeah. in there. You, you, you're allowed to focus on the situation, not yeah. on your equipment. Yeah. How Definitely. important is, in, in these processes for podcast is it for you to walk into a situation, not think about what you're holding and what you're doing, that it works, but also it becomes invisible to your subjects? Oh, it's so important. I mean, you know, I have had before I got my Zoom H6, I was mucking around and, and on something else and the recording failed. And you know, you can't ever recapture that, you know, you've got one shot. So that, that um, it's, it's massively important. And, you know, that's why the H6, the Zoom H6 speaks for itself. When you look at the ratings and reviews, um, it can do everything, you know, that is my, you know, from being someone with nothing, I had no podcasting equipment. That was sort of the best thing I could buy. That would be an audio interface, um, you know, a portable recorder, a six track recorder. So, you know, I just, I just walk in with the, um, you know, the, either the XY capsule or the mid side mic and, you know, you just hold it and you, and you speak to it and then you just kind of hold it in between the two people, you know, your two guests. And I could do that very, uh, not even thinking about it. Um, and I, I don't think once people, they, they might look at it and go, oh, what's that? Um, but after that, they're fine with it. And then, you know, eventually if I was going to do a sit down interview, I'd hook them up to a lapel through the zoom or, um, or I'd sit down and put two, you know, handheld mics there. But it's so important to have good uh, audio that is reliable, that can do everything. That you know, no matter, no matter what the situation is. I mean, just how powerful is is being able to walk around with a device that can capture stereo sound, or you can, you know, you can hone in on just your on your mid side and, and really um, aim where you want to where you want to get. Or chuck your shotgun. The shotgun mic um, attachment is so good. Just point and shoot that's fantastic and yeah it's so um diverse and um yeah, yeah. you can't just say you can't you can you can do a lot with vision you can't fix bad sound too easily you know no no uh, as my audio engineer mate tells me that you can't polish a turd <laughs> no, exactly right and what, what yeah. what's really what, what's really interesting is is, is uh, what you said earlier about the editing side of it because uh for me like i do a lot of filming out in the field but i, I really enjoy coming back to the edit suite and, and that's where you can really change what you've done from the perspective of, and, and normally for new people getting the storytelling, everyone loves doing filming or recording, but then they got to process all this shit. They're going, Oh my God, doing yeah, my editing. Yeah. Um, and I know as a copy, you take thousands of notes and, and, and mm. from, from a lot of experience I've had previously with people in the, in the job, the report writing and the, is just monstrous. Yeah. Would you rather, would you rather be doing tons of reports or doing, or sifting through four hours of, of edit <laughs> with dialogue. Oh, sifting through four hours of edit any day. Sure. <laughs> but that's an interesting point because in the early stages, and I'm sure you can probably agree with this, but in my early stages of podcasting, I would go out and record and I'd be recording for three hours. And then you've got to go back and edit through and find your good parts. And, but now I've kind of, I've learned um, to try and keep people on track a bit more and, um, you know, know when to press record and know when to stop. But then again, the golden rule is you got to record always because if you don't record, then you might miss something. But I but also it, 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 is, yeah. it is to a degree. It is to a degree. But as you yeah. say, you, you, you've you've as as a copy, you've got spatial awareness, um, and and 
as as a storyteller, uh, I was actually watching a, a a story the other day online about situational awareness because mm. you become you become super aware of what's going on around you in that small space where you're recording. Yeah. And so you you can use. I mean, I, I'm curious what tips you have for people, but I use mannerisms. Yeah. Um, it's really hard. Uh, not to talk over someone when you start doing this because then you'll get your voice in it as well. Um, mm. And so I tend to be like a mannequin using my mannerisms to guide what I want them to say or do based on how I do things. And that mm. keeps things focused. What sort of things have you learned about, you know, doing the podcast to keep it concise when you, when you're dealing with someone face to face? Yeah. <laughs> well, it took a long time. It probably took me the whole of being on Valley road, probably a whole year for me to be able to, <laughs> to get that so the first the first year i, I did just record uh with with their permission of course but i did just record and then i would just take uh, mental notes of what time that significant part was um but to give you an example of um yeah well going back to your other point keeping people on track or trying like using mannerisms is good too but that is a real hard thing to do to try and if you've got someone who just wants to keep talking, it's really, it's really hard to try and interject and, and say, all right, we've got to, we've got to wrap this up or we've got to change topics here or you're, you're rambling. Um, sometimes it's better just yeah, to, to edit that out or let them go. But you know, that will stop is, recording. Yeah, exactly. We'll <laughs> stop recording. But you know, as far as spatial awareness goes, um, one example would be, and being able to, to adjust on the fly um, with, with the Zoom mic and stuff. One thing that happened um, when I was recording Bean and Valley Road, I met, it was a really powerful um, time actually. We met Tamika who, you know, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with um, the podcast, Tamika was the sister of the partner who is at the center of this story, who, who, may, who may be responsible for Kira's death. And she agreed to meet uh, me and Alison. So, you know, you've got the person who, my, she thought she was responsible for Kira's death because she did have a fight with Kira and that's all on record and that's given to police statements and all that sort of stuff, you know, but she held that weight, you know, for five years and Alison, that's the strength of these two women that Alison met Tamika at a pub and they both chatted it out. And, um, you know, that was really powerful, but what we, I was talking to Tamika alone. We had two lapel mics on, we were, we were chatting there, you know, um, it was a it was a brewery, so it was pretty noisy in the background. There was kegs and you know beer being brewed, but um, you know it, it also adds to the experience. And I could tell that Alison was just getting close. I was kept looking in the corner of my eye. Alison was over, you know, sitting away, um, out of earshot. But I could see her coming closer and closer. And she just wanted to like over the about half an hour. She just wanted to to come in and and finally say something. So. Mm -hmm. As I was watching that, I, um, I made an adjustment and just um, took my lapel off and put it onto um, Alison. And I was standing close enough to be picked up, you know, by those two condensers, but, you know, hooking them both up. And uh, it, was, it was really good that I did that, thankfully, because in that one moment, they, you know, embraced and um, Alison said, whatever, whatever part you played, I forgive you, you know, and that's, you know, that's huge. Um, so if I, if I wasn't aware of that or I didn't think, oh, let's, let's change mics here or let's, um, you know, think on the fly, then I might not have got that, that moment. So that's an is that some, is, that, is that something that do you, you think as a, you know, as a, as a, as a new storyteller in, in this industry that comes in time or it's something that has to be in you? Because a lot of, a lot of film, TV, and radio schools try to teach that intuition. I mean, from your perspective, having been, sort of full gamut and seeing the powerful results of that do you think that's something that people can learn in the field i think it's definitely something people can learn um to be aware of it but i also have always been that kind of an intuitive uh person like uh, just aware of people's um moods and you know like i know i just know how to read people i guess maybe maybe i'm wrong sometimes but that's something that i've <laughs> that I've kind of always had in my personality. Um, but there's also been times where I've missed opportunities as well. Like I haven't recorded things that I could have because I've always been like, when you're doing true crime, you know, there's, there's risks and you have to make sure people know they're being recorded and permission for that. Um, so I always had to get that 
first. Um, so that was something that I was always aware of, but, and I've made some monstrous mistakes too. Like in one, one episode, um, it, it was pretty funny. I didn't know what happened, but I had a different sample rate. So I was recording it at 48 and in my project on my, um, my logic, my, my digital audio workstation, it was 41 or whatever it is. And I didn't know, this is before I had known these little things that everyone knows now, but uh, being new, it, I sounded like, yeah, a robot or just underwater. We all said, everyone said, are you stoned? I'm like, no, I'm not stoned. I honestly <laughs> not stoned. And then it wasn't until about a year later. So like now I figured out that it was a different sample rate and that's why it sounds so bad. And, you know, it's already been listened to a couple hundred thousand times. So. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's, a, there's a whole episode of this you could talk about mistakes. I mean, I, as yeah. I said, in this industry, you, there's never, I always tell people to work with me, never make small mistakes, make yeah. huge ones because they're way easier to find. And it's these little things that sort of sneak through and you live there and you, and you just can't figure it out. And, um, and what I've actually got on my phone is on all the audio devices I've got and cameras, I actually f take a photo of what the settings are. So in oh. case I just have that, that holy crap moment where you're about to record, I'll just open the phone, look at it just to make sure it was right. Yeah. Because uh, I've been doing it for 22 years, but I still make mistakes as if I just came out of film school, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. And also the, in, it is the situations mm. you're in, mm. people need to realize you're not in a studio. You're not in a, in a, in a, in a, in a set that, it's going to be controlled yeah. you're in an environment that is is constantly changing as you said in, in the brewery um mm. so you've got to be focused on your environment more than the technology um as as a as a storyteller now do you feel i mean when you're in the police force you have a, a social and and uh, i guess an obligation and an oath that you've sworn but do you feel more of a weight as a storyteller now because of the responsibility that these stories carry Yes and no. Um, you know, the weight of the, as, of the police officer, I've, I found really heavy um, because sometimes you can't help people or, you know, if someone's always going to be upset with you, no matter what you do, someone's going to be pissed. You know, whether you can help them or you can't help them, you know, someone's going to be arrested or not arrested. The person being arrested is going to hate you or the person not being arrested uh, will be thankful, but the person who made the complaint will be pissed off at you that you didn't arrest them. So, yeah, you can't. You can't win a lot of the time. Um, but as a storyteller, yeah, you do, you know, you do, sometimes you do get um, some trolls or some, you know, some hate messages um, or threatening stuff. And, you know, that does weigh on me or, or bad, like in the, in the initial stages when I first started this, put the podcast up there and bad reviews really, really got to me. Like, you know, it was like, someone would give it a one star and say, Oh, this is shit. Or this is, this guy's fucking hopeless, whatever. Uh, that would really get to me. Um, but now I realize, well, you're never going to please everybody. Um, you know, people hate the best, the best, um, you know, like you look at Conor McGregor, a good example of that, you know, he's arguably a very good fighter and a good athlete, but he's got plenty of people that hate him. Um, you can't, you can't let, um, you can't let that get to you. So I've had to learn some skills to try and deal with that. That's something that I've got to work on and just not let the one negative ruin the thousand positive. That's yeah, look, it's, I've, I've had, a, I've had a, a rule pretty much since I started uh, because obviously when you're putting films out, you're always going to get a whole gamut of stuff. Um, yeah. Is it, unless I get the same criticism three times, I just ignore it. Yeah. Yeah, true. I just ignore it. And, uh, and it's, it's really interesting when you talk about coming up with the number three, you'll get one or two quite a lot, quite yeah. a lot. Yeah. But the third time, mate, it's near impossible. And then if you do get three people looking at it, then I have a look at it and go, yeah, there actually is something wrong with it. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. You know, but then again, once it's out there, it's out there. Yeah, exactly. You've exactly. Got, you know, you just got to learn from it. Yeah. Well, that said, you can't put a baby back in the womb, can you? No, no, no. And you know, like I used to apologize for, cause when I met like, I think the other thing to your, you know, your point about the, the microphone being more powerful than a gun, I think also being in a public space um, is more powerful than being in a studio with, with um, cameras, lights, and, you know, you're looking down, you know, a journalist is asking these questions and you're on TV. That's way more intimidating than meeting someone at a pub with a lapel microphone on that you can't even see and there's no lights, there's no cameras and you're just having a chat over a beer um, and Katie, for example, 
she wanted to meet in a public spot. She, she chose a park and I was really conscious of that park because it was right on the main road. It was really, really loud. There was Harleys, there was cars. And um, I apologized in the start of those episodes. I was sorry about the noise and no one complained about the noise. They all, they all actually said to me, please stop saying sorry for the noise. We like it. It's good. It's good, you know, good visual for where you are. And, all that. and so something that I was really worried about, other people weren't. So and that, that, that's, that's, look, that's a really, that's a really poignant um, mm. thing you, you touched on. And it's, it's a topic of some of the other um, discussions I'm having with other artists is that sound isn't just dialogue. No. And you said, said really clearly it painted a picture of where you are and, and the background sounds, the little nuances, the, the, the pauses, when you pause in an interview, that's mm. some of the noisiest time in an interview. Exactly. Because it allows people to digest what you've just spoken with. A lot of people that are starting out in, in, in this industry don't realise that uh, what I call the power of the pause. That if you if you say something and, and and then you get an interesting response and then you say nothing, mm -hmm. do you find then that when you have those longer pauses, that what's going to come out of your um, subject's mouth next could be the most extraordinary thing? Hundred percent, mate. That's something you learn when you do investigative interviewing you know, in the police, silence is everything. Like, let it be, let it be silent. Ask an open-ended question and let there be silence because people want to feel the silence. Like they don't like it. So your subject might want to keep going and say something they might not have wanted to say, or they might just let something rip without thinking about it. And yeah, definitely people, you know, that's usually where some really big things happen or some revelations happen and some OR moments, you know? So yeah, definitely. Except, except, except when you're trying to negotiate with your wife. Silence, <laughs> yeah. silence, silence bad, never, yeah. never works. Don't, don't even go there. I don't negotiate, mate. I just, um, <laughs> I just say yes. I just say yes, yes, no, sorry. Yeah, definitely. So, so, so moving forward with the, with the skills you've now got and and I guess a, a newfound passion. Uh, yeah. What what so what's next? What do you what do you want to apply these um these, these newfound skills to? Well, oh, I've absolutely fallen in love with podcasting, um, for sure. I just think it's so cool. I love it. Um, I just I really enjoy. I don't enjoy so much like sifting through hours and hours of stuff and deciding whether to keep something but i really enjoy putting it together and you know joining your regions and making it seamless and putting little sound effects in and and then you get your finished product i really that's really satisfying and really um i don't know rewarding for me so i find that really and like i guess i had this burning desire growing up to be creative creative can't say that word but i didn't know where to like i can't draw i can't paint uh, i can't sing so how do I be creative? Um, and I didn't know how to do that. And then this thing came along and there you go. That's my creative outlet. Um, so going forward, um, I have a few um, through being a Valley road. Um, mental health was one of the topics that came up and that's something that I'm passionate about. So I want to do a podcast um, about mental health and I want to speak to people who might have some, um, success in life, I guess, um, not, not to take away from people who aren't famous or aren't, you know, musicians or actors or athletes, but I think it's powerful if those people who have succeeded and people, uh, they're role models for people, if they can have their story heard that they're not perfect, they have battles, they have demons, that's really powerful. So, you know, like Greg Inglis on Australian Story the other week, you know, he, he spilled his beans about being depressed and what he went through. And that was so powerful because you've got this guy who's, just this incredible athlete and people look up to him and he's just letting it, letting everyone know in Australia that he's had these massive issues. And mm. you know, I think that's powerful. So I want to do a podcast about mental health and um, I'd started, I'd released um, a podcast called cop that, um, but I've actually taken it down because of what's going on in, in the world with police. Um, mm. I don't want to take away from the black lives matter movement. Um, but I had planned this a long time before, that happened, but um, basically that's where I'm going to speak to ex police officers who I worked with and they're going to tell their stories. Um, and the theme there is um, something heroic, something hilarious and something horrific that they had in their police career. So I've interviewed like probably four or five people for that, but I just haven't released 
release it yet, but that's really interesting. And I'm really passionate about that because despite doing true crime podcasts, um, you know, it might fall, you know, when you do a cold case, um, it might fall, you know, people might think that you're against the police or you're having a go at them. But in, in fact, I'm actually pro police and I think they do a great job. And um, I think there is a few bad eggs out there, but the majority of the people are good, are good people. Um, so I want to, I want to give them a platform to speak. Uh, I think that's really powerful and ex-police can speak because they're not current serving members with um, red tape around them. Um, and I also want to do more true crime eventually. And uh, I've got another idea for a fictional thing. I think fiction, I never thought I'd be into fiction, but uh, I, I, I am now. <laughs> I listen to fiction podcasts. <laughs> um, and I think that is a way to really get uh, more creative because then you can soundscape the whole thing. You know, you've actually got to set, it's basically like a movie, but just audio. So that's my next, I want to take it to the next level in that, in that regard. Man, you're going to be busy, especially with a new child as well. I think um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah. the, the sound, sound, the stories through sound, they, they captivate, you know, and, and I, I, one of, one of the, the, uh, the final thing I've really got sort of advice I've got to people is that, you know, if you can, if you can play something back to someone and you're watching a documentary, you can watch it with your eyes closed and still figure out what's going on and enjoy it. Then yeah. the vision's the vision is literally just the icing on the cake. So, yeah. um, mate, uh, thank you very much for, for for taking the time. I know you're you're a massive celebrity now after the ABC story. And uh, <laughs> nah, th nah. thanks for having a chat. And um, is there, I mean, are there any questions you've got for me, which would be polite for me not to ask? Well, um, that's something you know. I I would actually like to one day venture over to doing both film and audio, uh, but that's another whole you know, game and I've never learned anything about film. So what would be your advice in making that transition one day? Gee whiz. Well, that's a big question, isn't it? Um, mm. I, I never planned on doing this for a living. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it sort of happened by accident and it, that accident happened 22 years ago and you're still doing it. Mm. Um, I don't think I really mastered my craft. I don't think you ever do. Mm. Um, I think the way you've gone into podcasting is the way you go into film. You just go in with an open mind and, and just no idea. And mm -hmm. I think it's hard these days to choose what equipment because there's such a gamut of stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and the advice I give to people that ask, would ask that question is, you know what, start using your iPhone. Okay. Because if you yeah. can shoot, if you can, no camera's going to teach you composition. No camera's going to teach you yeah. um, how to tell a story, what to put in front of the camera, how to capture what's there. Yeah, uh, it's the same as a microphone. You know, if you if you'd gone into audio school, you probably wouldn't have come out with much more knowledge. You, yeah, technically mm. you might have got things right. Yeah, these days in the equipment, in the audio gear, and in most of the camera gear, it'll do it for you. The guys that make these things are way smarter than we are, and yeah. and that stuff it, it'll take care of itself. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Mm. So if you can if you can shoot a story with a GoPro or an iPhone of you of you you know, your three month old little boy mm. and you can get it to make sense. All you're doing is putting bigger and better lenses in front of it to make it look nicer. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's pretty that's, much it. That's good advice. I think I just got to practice that because, um, I mean, everything's the same. There's a beginning, middle and end. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't matter what you're watching. Yeah. doesn't matter what you look at. Mm. There's no edit software. There's no computer. So for example, behind me, I'm running software that's was built in 2012. Mm. Right. Um, most of the gear I'm using, I'm using an old, uh, in the field, I'm using an old um, Apple MacBook Pro 17 inch because I didn't make them anymore. So I bought three of them on eBay about 10 years ago <laughs> because it's got a big screen and I can use, I don't, you know, yeah. I don't have to wear my glasses all the time. Yeah. All the technology I'm using is pretty old because mm. it doesn't, there's no technology that makes you a better storyteller. No, no. exactly. No. You've got to get that skill first. <clears throat> it's just the yeah. marketing that gets yeah. you into it. And yeah. you, know, you need, you need, you know, for example, with cameras, they talk about 15 stops of dynamic range. In mm. my mind, as, a, and as an older filmmaker, that means 12 stops of messing up. Mm. Because yeah. if you can shoot it properly, you don't, obviously, if you're shooting a film, you want to grade it and put a nice feel to it. But aside from that, if you get it right in the camera the first time, you don't need any of that stuff. And no. so all the gear I'm using <clears throat> is older gear because it doesn't make you a better storyteller but from an audio perspective when zoom comes out with new microphone heads i remember there was a new head for the f1 i was using and, and they were saying well you got to try this i'm like yeah but the old one works and i said well just try this yeah audio technology has been a massive leap and i put mm. the new one on and went 
wow. You know, yeah. that was that was ridiculous. It makes yeah. my job easier. So yeah. I would say don't don't get bogged down in, in kit. Okay. You, if you apply the same storytelling that you do for your podcast and just put a phone in front of it, mate, the story is going to be there. You know, mm. the only difference is you, you're going to have bigger file sizes and more hard drive space, mm. but that's it. Mm. And uh, and then the whole 4K thing, I have not had one request in the last 10 years that requires 4K because they don't broadcast in 4K. Your iPhone, I mean, you, you don't you don't need that. You just need something that's sharp and that you can keep focus with. You know, it's same as if you get muffled sound, you can't fix that. No. A blur image, you can't fix it. Make sure it's no. sharp, beginning, middle, end, and, and get get that get that flow right. And then if you shoot a story with your iPhone or a GoPro and edit it, then you know what your story is and you can decide what kit you want to put behind it so you can then add to it. It's like it's like buying a bike, you know. Mm. People spend a fortune on the bike frame and put shit wheels on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well it you sounds know? like I've got homework to do. Well, hey, look, you've got plenty of time now, right? Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right, yeah. Well, mate, th- th- thanks a lot for your time. And, uh, thank uh, you, Anthony. For, for anyone that's watching this, they'll, uh, they'll, uh, Zoom will be providing links and all the stuff that they normally do with this yep. technology. Um, so uh, until next time, um, stay safe. Look forward to uh, following Jamie's podcast because they're pretty damn cool. Oh, well, thank everyone. you. Thanks, Anthony, and thank you, Zoom, for being uh, such good manufacturers of audio equipment. <laughs>